Choctaw traditional culture is a, an amazing gift that was passed down to us by our ancestors. There are different ways that we can learn about it. Choctaw language is one of the best ways that, that knowledge and that culture are embodied in the language. And in other ways, by looking at the things our ancestors left behind, the physical objects. And learning about that aspect of Choctaw history, weapons are one of the best avenues for understanding how, how they thought about things and how Choctaw culture changed through time. Archaeology is the study of learning about past people by what they left behind in the ground. And at first, archaeologists did not believe that our ancestors lived side by side with giant animals. They didn't think that was possible. Over a number of years of study, archaeology found out not only were the Choctaw oral stories right, that our ancestors did live with giant animals at the end of the last ice age. Not only did we live with them, but we also hunted them. Our ancestors did, and this was long before the bow and arrow. Archaeology has found that our ancestors who lived side by side with the giant animals made this type of stone spearhead, or this type of knife blade right here. Archaeologists call them Clovis points. They're different sizes, but they're made from pieces of stone that have a lot of silica in them. And our ancestors learned how to harness that particular characteristic of the rock to make it break in the way that they wanted it to. And they would use that to make sharp edged cutting tools like these knife blades here. They would take a, a piece of stone at the quarry, they would knock off large chips that they could use as tools, cutting tools, scraping tools, things like that. And then they would make these knife blades out of the core part of it. Some of the Clovis points were smaller, like this one here. This one's actually a projectile point. It's made for being thrown through the air. If you try to use this just on the end of a stick to stab an elephant, for example, one of the animals that our ancestors hunted, the woolly mammoth, it won't go in very far. But our ancestors, like people all over the world, developed this pretty impressive technology known as the atlatl. Our people, a long time ago, a long time ago, before there were the bows and arrows, there were uh, atlatls, which is a spear launcher. And that's for hunting, uh, hunting pretty good sized game like bison and uh, uh, mastodons and some of them giant critters. Now this is a little different of an atlatl than most people will see. Most people see a piece of wood cut out uh, out of a board or a plank shaped into an atlatl with a point on it uh, to throw the spear. This one's actually a the spine bone of a buffalo. The dart is weighted so that the, the tip end is heavier than the base. That makes it so that as it goes through the air, it doesn't flip end over end. It stays straight like a missile. It also has feathers attached at the back end of it, and these provide drag. That keeps it from wobbling very much in the air. It also, the feathers naturally have a little bit of a twist to them, so that creates a spiral motion through the air, just like a rifle bullet or a football. What makes it effective is the atlatl itself, which is this right here. The atlatl acts like an extension to your arm, just like the way stickball sticks do. You can throw a stickball a lot farther with a pair of stickball sticks if you know what you're doing than you can by hand. And this is the same thing. Uh, you put your spear right there on that little point, like that, and you rear it back and you sling it, and you sling it hard. And the more you throw an atlatl, it's like throwing a baseball, the more accurate you're, you'll get. You're throwing your own atlatl, and you're throwing your own spears, and you make your own spears a certain way every time. You get accurate after a couple thousand throws. And then you throw it, and this adds length to your arm. It also adds another joint to your arm. And you can get 40 times more force throwing the dart like this than you could just by hand. These, these darts can be made to go 200 yards in the air. Studies have shown that this type of dart has a better penetrating power than a 30-06 rifle up close. 
This can penetrate through three feet of elephant flesh at close range. So even though our ancestors didn't have rifles, they didn't have the bow and arrow, they knew how to use the things around them, just basic simple materials, in order to make this weapon that's as deadly as a modern rifle at close range. And over time, the landscape that they lived on changed. And over time, you know, our ancestors' technology changed. They came up with new things. So they started to hunt the deer after the, the large animals went away at the end of the Ice Age. <clears throat> they started using smaller points. They started using darts that were lighter weight. And they were perfectly designed to take out those deer. Then about 700 years ago or so, Choctaw people started to use the bow and arrow. Yeah, you make a bow. You carve it down. When you're carving on this wood and you carve through that growth ring, you got to start over and, sh and shave it down to the next growth ring. You shave it down, then you hack the back down to get the, the bellies of the bow made. Hack into the back like this. Put it up there. Taking it apart. Making a bow is, is quite a quite a challenge. And again, it, it speaks to the intelligence and the sophistication that our ancestors had. First, you have to know the right kind of wood to use, which isn't that complicated. You have to know the right species. You have to find a tree that's growing with straight grain. You have to know where those are located. Then our ancestors would go out and harvest them. And then they would do what's known as tillering. They would remove the wood from the belly side of the bow in exactly the right way so that the bow would have the right draw length, the right draw weight, and it would bend evenly. Strings were made out of various types of materials. One of the most common was isi hakshish. That's what this is. This is a string that's made out of deer tendon. You take the tendons out of the animal's back or out of its leg you scrape off any meat that might be attached to them and then you dry them out after they dry out you take a you take the tendon and put it on a log and you pound it fairly gently with a rock hammer stone just until the fibers start to separate a little bit next you take your hands and you shred those fibers it looks almost like dental floss you shred that tendon into all of these individual fibers you take those fibers and you soak them in water they have natural hide glue in them and then you start to twist them together. You make the string while it's wet, you dry it under tension, and then you put it on a bow and you shoot it a couple of times. And the first few times you shoot it, the string will stretch. You adjust the knot, shoot it again. This string's pretty big. It's made for this bow that's 70 pounds. And at the time, all I had were deer tendons that were about this long. So it's made out of little bitty tendons with lots of splices, but it's still extremely strong. Uh, I usually carve a handle like this, make it comfortable for my hand, with an arrow rest, and just shoot it like this. Arrow points are mostly really small. If you have something like this size and you stick it on the end of an arrow, it's not going to fly real well because this weights the arrow down. Most arrow points are, are about this size or smaller. But, but that's how you make a bow. This one's pretty stout too. It's real stout. In the Choctaw homeland, there are several, several different types of stone that our ancestors used for making weapons and other types of tools. This is one of them right here. It's called Tasanok in the Choctaw language. In English, you might call it flint. What our ancestors would do with that stone is they would actually change its nature for two different reasons. One was to make it glassier and easier to chip. Another was to make it red color. In Choctaw traditional thought, red is associated with war. It's associated with hunting. So if you have a, a red stone tip, that gives your arrow more power. This particular stone has iron ore in it. That's what gives it its yellow color naturally. When our ancestors heated it up, they basically made it rust, which caused it to turn this red color like these two here. I'd like to show you this. This is a knife called Bashpo in the Choctaw language. And this is a pretty fancy one. It's got a large stone blade on it. 
this type of stone is not found in the Choctaw homeland. Our ancestors used to trade for types of stone that weren't found there. This particular one's from northeastern Oklahoma. So there were trade knives like this back before European contact. Places in Oklahoma like Spyro would trade this type of stone pretty widely. A knife like this could be used in war. It's not the most useful. I mean, you can cut somebody with that. Really, this type of knife is useful for cutting frozen meat or it's useful for cutting through cartilage. Um, the most effective knives for skinning or butchering were just made out of river cane. They're just small knives made out of river cane. They work real good. Choctaw men used other types of weapons besides the bow and arrow. One of those was the blowgun. It's called Pashi Flonfa in the Choctaw language. It's made out of Oski river cane. This blowgun's about the size I like to use, about the size of a quarter, a little bit bigger, and the longer the joints, the better. The cane has these joints naturally, and by splitting it in half, you're able to clean out those joints. So the cane is just like a hollow tube once you stick the two halves back together. This goes with a blowgun dart called Shomo in the Choctaw language. This is a small one. It's made to go with this blowgun. The old Choctaw blowgun darts were 20 inches long, a lot of them. They were made from yellow pine heartwood and they were fletched with thistle down. The, the part of the flower that turns the fluff in the summer, later into the fall. You take a, a head of that fluff and you take a, a piece of string made from plant fiber and you carefully twist the dart, catching a little bit of that fluff with every every turn of the dart and it attaches it to the string and then you tie it off. The purpose of the fletching is to go into the breech of the blowgun and plug it up like that so that when you blow on it it catches the air and forces it out at a great deal of velocity. Choctaw darts for the most part were not poison. There are a few old accounts of them being dipped in rattlesnake venom or being put in rotten meat but it, with the Choctaw dart it's not necessary to poison it because the traditional ones are big I mean they're like little arrows so when you're hunting with the blowgun dart you want it to skewer through the animal so like penetrate all the way through the animal so that it has trouble running those big darts could easily do that with a squirrel um, they could easily do it with a bird even as large as a turkey to, to make a weapon that you pull back and you let it fly and that weapon hits it mark hits where you want it to go there's a lot of satisfaction there's a lot of peace you find right there that's something that that you know that that came from your ancestors but looking at the tools that they left behind teaches us something about how our ancestors approached the world and what you find is that our ancestors were every bit as intelligent as we are today. They were every bit as human as we are today. And through time, they created a number of advanced civilizations, a whole series of them. So when you look at these things and think about these things, this isn't primitive technology. You know, this is made by really intelligent people, and they had a lot of time to do it, hundreds of generations. Choctaw weapons making is something that's connected me to my culture and to my family on the Choctaw side since I was a little kid. You know, with the knowledge that you develop through something like that comes responsibility. One of those main responsibilities is to pass it on.